Welcome back to the Blister and Muck podcast. I'm Jenny Mason, your host and the creator of the Blister and Muck series. This week, Blister and Muck enlist help from some chimpanzees. The results go rilla wild, rilla fast. When we left off last time, Dr. Van Sangfroyd had just purloined Albert Hurley's precious and pompous panther. Before filching the feral feline, the doctor revealed at least some of his motives. For instance, he set all those electromagnetic traps around Black Rust in order to locate Madame Putresca, and by extension, locate her underground headquarters. Somehow, her animal menagerie will help the doctor shore up human shortcomings. I don't know about you, but I could sure go for some koala thumbs. Koalas have two thumbs on each hand, and if I had that, I could really kick some bee on Fortnite. Oh, but how horrible would it be if Dr. Van Sangfroyd wanted to dice up and divvy out animal parts? And it's hardly practical. You can't just stitch an alligator mouth to someone's face and expect them to start yomping whole beef briskets. So what is the evil doctor really planning? And if his idea succeeded in making people cooler, faster, or better, then wouldn't he be hailed as a hero? All of which begs the question, what is the difference between a hero and a villain? Are heroes successful champions, while villains are the unlucky losers? Genghis Khan was extremely successful at expanding his medieval Mongolian empire. Is he a hero, even though he and his armies slaughtered hundreds of thousands of innocent people? The same could be said of Alexander the Great, or President Andrew Jackson. Perhaps what denotes a hero from a villain boils down to their drawing skills. That is to say, both hero and villain start off aiming for something awesome, maybe even something that will benefit others, such as koala thumbs. But at some point, the person who becomes a hero draws a line. A hero pauses to consider if her continued actions will do more harm than good. Whereas the person who becomes a villain doggedly, stubbornly presses on, regardless of the consequences. Regardless of who gets hurt. I don't pretend to have the answer, but I do wonder, is a villain simply a hero who mistakenly believes he is so right he can do no wrong? Episode 7, Showstoppers. While Tabby and Muck tussled, the lion named Cecil refused to release Blister. In that helpless instant, Blister sensed a kind of split somewhere inside, the way a crack vines across thick glass. He could not have named it if you or I had asked him to, he only knew he had felt it before, long ago, and had vowed to never experience it again. Springing from a nearby cage, Madame Putresca landed on Tabby. She delivered an acrobatic walloping, first to Tabby, and then to the cat Blister called Slackjaw, who, up to that moment, had been busily chasing a beetle. The other cats swiftly surrounded her, she jump-kicked their noses. She throttled their sides. Finally, she hurled Tabby by his whiskers, slung Slackjaw by his ears, and flung the remaining cats by their tails. All of the defeated felines sprinted out of the stable. Don't mess with that rat, Cecil awed. Tell me about it, Blister said as he coaxed the lock open. The lion bolted from the cage. Blister hurried over to Muck. Are you okay? 
Okay. I'm positively potent. Did you see me fight that feline? We should go after Dr. Van Sangfroyd and Vexler. You surmised my sentiments superbly. Outside the stable, they encountered a whole new pandemonium. The last of the cats drained away into the darkness, but a new threat emerged from the circus wagons. Animal handlers armed with ropes, nets, and whips charged at the fleeing creatures. Albert Hurley was among them, lashing a whip, shouting at the creatures to get back in their cages. The red eye of his cigar glared resolute. The peacocks panicked and quickly tangled up in each other's long tails. Luckily, Cecil's roar routed the handlers. Albert raised his whip, about to lash the lion, when the dull-eyed camel spat his slimy cud right in Albert's face. Cecil chased Albert who ran half-blinded by the goo glob. People and performers flooded out of the big tent, screaming. The elephants stormed around the perimeter in their sparkling capes and feathered caps. They blundered through the light strands, ripping the cords which spat sparks. The electric generators whined, squealed, and sparked. Finally, they coughed up fire and black smoke. The elephants uprooted the giant stakes, machine-driven into the ground. What are they doing? Putreska exclaimed as she exited the stable riding atop gorgeous George. George, what did you tell them? I told them what you said. I said it's time to bust out of here. Tension cables snapped. Without these cables to hold the heavy red and white canvas up, the giant upright poles inside the pavilion crunched like bug shells. Finally, the entire big top collapsed like a peppermint souffle. Putra! We're going after Van Sangfroyd, Blister called to her. Okay, honey, I am being right behind you, after I am rounding up these crazy elephants. She tugged on George's ear, spurring him to the collapsed tent as fast as he could shuffle. Pus, Fungus, Crud, Meyer, and Yuck were already leading their designated groups of animals away. Wait, I need the chimpanzees. Blister shouted. The chimpanzee troop bounded over. What's the plan? Muck asked. Blister scanned the moonlit horizon. He located the doctor and Vexler in the meadow heading for the dark forest. He said to Muck, You remember the graveyard ghost at Oddvine Park? Muck smiled. Are you suggesting we serve up a sequel? Blister grinned and winked. To the chimpanzees, he said, Half of you, go to the costume wagon and get as many masks as you can carry. Meet the rest of us in the meadow. Blister and Muck climbed aboard a chimp's back and set off. One chimp chuckled. They say, you gotta get the monkey off your back. But what about the rat? The troop chuckled as it raced through the tall grass. <laughs> The chimpanzee carrying Blister and Muck said, Does that make me a conspirator? Again, the troop cackled and giggled. (laughs) You realize we're chasing after a mad scientist? Is that rational? Cackles and giggles mixed with hoots and screeches. Even Muck let loose and laughed. Ticks and maggots, Blister sighed. Come on, you guys, get serious. Yeah, after all, we're mounting a counter rat tack. The hooting, cackling laughter snagged Dr. Van Sangfroyd's attention. As he turned to face his pursuers, the doctor aimed the revolver. Boom, boom, boom. 
bright, fiery flashes blossomed from the muzzle as bullets zinged across the meadow. The whole chimpanzee troop belly dropped on the ground. How inconsiderate, a chimpanzee jibed, stirring another giggle eruption. Keep going, Dr. Van Sangfoyd shouted at Vexler. Creakity, creakity, the cart resumed its course. Vexler dissolved into the black forest. The chimpanzees and the rat passengers resumed the chase. Only this time they remained under the cover of the meadow grass. The moon shed enough light for Dr. Van Sangfroyd to see ripples in the meadow. He took aim, touched the trigger, and crash, brumble, snap. <coughs> A herd of elephants broke out of the thick forest and ran sidelong at the doctor. Crack him! Putresca bellowed, still saddled on gorgeous George's head. Van Sangfroyd pointed the gun at Putresca and George. Oh, dear! Muck crossed both arms over his eyes. Blister slid off the chimpanzee's back and picked up a rock. He shoved this into the chimpanzee's calloused, leathery palm, pointed at the doctor and shouted, Throw this! Hard as you can! The chimp coiled his arm, gnashed his teeth, and then hurled the rock. It foomed through the air and whacked the gun out of Dr. Van Sangfroyd's grip. The doctor spun around and ran from the rampaging elephants. Rather than hobble or stiffly limp, Dr. Van Sangfroyd sprinted on quick and nimble legs. The elephants pursued him. By now, the remainder of the chimpanzee troop had arrived with armfuls of frightful masks. Let's go get that panther, Blister commanded. Vexler labored to drive the cart through the forest. Where the moon had silvered the meadow, it hardly pewtered the woods. The wheels bumped over roots and crunched underbrush debris. The box containing the panther scraped against the branches or thudded against tree trunks. All the commotion unsettled the panther, who yowled and growled and clawed at the wood slats around his cage. <sighs> Be quiet, Vexler gruffed, glad to feel more himself again. The panther rebutted with another ferocious growl. Vexler retorted with a long string of unsavory curse words directed at Dr. Van Sangfroyd and the whole harebrained scheme. Vexler did not like harebrained schemes, especially when they failed disastrously, as this one had. He also did not like being alone in the woods with a seething predator. He should have never made inquiries to find another dancing bear. Or, more accurately, he should have ended his search when those inquiries crossed his path with the doctor. But now it was too late. He knew too much about the hidden intelligence of animals. Rats with unbelievable aptitudes. Elephants, monkeys, even pigeons had remarkable abilities he'd never imagined. And thus, Vexler knew he was not marooned with a dumb beast that ran on instincts. Rather, he was stranded with a clever and skillful killer. This knowledge settled like a block of ice in the pit of his gut. A nearby twig crack prompted him to swerve the cart defensively. Unfortunately, mid-swerve, the cart slammed into a felled tree. Both wheels snapped off the axle. The wood panels busted off their hinges, exposing the cage and the furious panther within. Vexler cursed. The panther snarled. Something in the branches above chuckled. <laughs> Vexler shot his gaze up and wheezed with fright. In the latticed silhouettes of the branches, he saw many pairs of eyes. Animal eyes, afire with the tarnished yellow gleam of night sight. 
Below the eyes, horrible mouths pronged with gray teeth sneered at him. The eyes and mouths belonged to heads rimmed with jagged spikes. Um, stay away! Bexler swung his fists. A menacing chuckle rose out of a scruffy bush nearby. <laughs> Vexler jumped away as a jagged head rose out of the foliage. Yellow eyes blinked. More glowing eyes floated up from other bushes or slid out from behind trees. A chorus of erratic giggles and chuffling chuckles rumbled around Vexler from above and all sides. Sweat iced his head and hands. Overhead, one giggle escalated into a hysterical screech. (laughs) A dark figure leapt from a branch. It dropped like a bomb towards Vexler. His backbone blazed with terror. He scrambled, stumbled, scuttled, and screamed through the underbrush. The jagged-headed monsters chased after him. Gradually, Vexler's screams faded. Blister, Muck, and the chimpanzees congregated near the panther's cage. What a prank! Yeah, congratulations! Cackling and hooting echoed through the woods until the panther roared. Then, the chimpanzees dropped their masks and slicked into the trees for safety. Stupid monkeys! Let me out of here! Would you listen to this overgrown alley cat? Blister strolled around the cage, which tipped haphazardly against the fallen tree and wreckage of the handcart. I thought you were too good to be freed by the likes of us. Oh, Blister, don't tease the beleaguered beast. Muck advised. Fuddy-duddy, Blister grumbled under his breath. To the panther, he said, If I let you out, I want your word that you'll behave. You must promise not to harm any of us. The panther coughed a haughty sigh and rolled his glowing eyes. Suit yourself. You can live what's left of your miserable life in that cage. Right here. Forever. Bye-bye. Blister turned on his heels and pulled Muck away. But, 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 Blister, we can't leave him. Yes, we can. All right, all right, I promise. The panther relented. Now hurry up and let's get out of here. Then, like a house cat expecting a saucer of milk, the panther sat in a regal posture, tail wrapped around his paws. Blister climbed to the padlock. Before he picked it, he warned again, One swipe, one bite, or snarl, and I will let my associate over there crack you in half. Blister pointed at Muck. He was personally trained in paw-to-paw combat by the Madame Putresca. Muck immediately straightened out of his nervous slouch. The panther cocked his head away to indicate his intense boredom. The lock clicked open. Blister slid the U-bend out of the latch and was about to hop back to the ground when the panther burst out. Still hiding in the branches above, the chimpanzees shrieked in a curdled panic. The panther darted at Muck, who quickly sidestepped the attack while simultaneously karate-chopping the panther's cheek. Hi-ya! Muck bellowed with every furry fiber in his being. The force of the punch rolled the panther sideways. The big cat sprawled in a daze, but hastened to his feet when the nearby bushes crumpled under the steady march of the elephant herd. Just as Gorgeous George and the other circus elephants broke through the foliage, the panther streaked away, a liquid shadow dissolving into night's lake. Everyone is being okay? Madame Putresca called down from her seat between George's ears. The chimpanzees dropped from the trees and piled on the backs of the other elephants. We're fine, Blister announced. Thanks to old Iron Paws over here. Muck 
fidgeted. Oh, I say, iron paws, me, nonsense, I mean really, the idea. They shimmied up George's trunk and sat beside Putresca. I hope you had better luck with the doctor than we had with the panther, Blister said. For being an old man, that doctor runs surprisingly fast, Putresca noted. He got away, but I don't think we are seeing the last of him. The certainty of her forecast settled like lumps of cold gravy. I am being so pleased with both of you, she clapped Blister and Muck on their backs. How would you be liking to be operatives, living in the caverns and eating three solid meals a day? Muck nearly squealed. He bounced on his bum, clasped his paws, and waited for Blister to answer. Ow! Blister managed. He hugged his knees a little tighter. What a, uh, an honor. I will definitely think about it. Hmm, Putresca mused. And what about you, Muck? Will you be thinking too? Muck's eyes ping-ponged from Blister to Putresca. He hugged his knees and said, I dare say the offer deserves a thorough... Thoughtful reply. I see, Madame Putresca said. She directed the elephants to the steep and stony headlands on the beach where the old pirate tunnels would take them to the caverns under excess capital bank. Well, despite all the monkey business, we certainly learned a lot from this episode. Apparently, involving chimpanzees turns a fleeing villain into an esque ape e. And it's no surprise that Panther got away. He is, after all, an ape ex predator. We also learned that things can go wrong at any given moment. On the bright side, it may be a very long while before we encounter Vexler Q. Drummle again. He was so spooked, I bet he runs all the way to next ape roll. Tune in next week to find out if Blister decides to join Madame Putresca's operatives, or if he remains unaffiliated and ape-political. In the meantime, stop by blisterandmuck.com and use the contact form to tell me what you think will happen next. Or, how do you tell the difference between heroes and villains? Got any good monkey jokes to share? If you can make your joke rhyme, then you may be the first person in the history of ever to compose a lemurick. Would you like Blister and Muck to visit your school? Ask your teacher to pretty please with a cherry on top, send an email to contact at blisterandmuck.com. Dot com. The Blister and Muck podcast is made possible because of listeners like you supporting the show. Tell your friends and total strangers at the grocery store to listen along. Or, if you're not into the whole using your mouth to communicate thing, you can tell others about the show by sporting your very own Blister and Muck shirt, hat, or face mask. Visit the Support the Show page at blisterandmuck.com and browse the online store. A portion of your purchase helps keep this show on the air. And when you open the shipping bag containing your tote bag or sweatshirt, you'll find a special thank you card with a link to a secret page at blisterandmuck.com. Enter the password on that thank you card, and you'll hear a special message from the entire Blister and Muck gang. Hey, moms, dads, teachers, and other awesome adults who listen along, if you tap the subscribe button and enter your email at blisterandmuck.com, I promise I won't clutter your inbox with special offers or supercilious folderol. I'll send you one delightful email each week as soon as the newest episode releases. And as a special thank you, 
I'll send you a free blister and muck sticker. What an amazing... Huh? Huh? What's that? Oh, you have two kiddos who love the show, and each one needs a sticker or else it's tantrum time? No problem. I'll send you two free stickers. Such a stupendous... What? Oh, you have 12 kids and each one needs a sticker? I'm sure we can work out a fair trade. Subscribe for one sticker and then share 11 jokes or puns in exchange for 11 more stickers. Special thanks to composer Roland Rudzitis for serving up the Blister and Muck theme song. Additional music from Kevin McLeod and Mon Plaisir. Many stock sounds were public domain at freesound.org and the Sound Bible. Mike Koenig and Daniel Simon made the scary sounds. Extra special thanks to my family, friends, and fans. One for one, and all for you.